Brian Edinger, a merchandiser from AGT Foods. And Ryan grew up on a farm in McIntosh, South Dakota, and attended Dickinson State. And he's been with AGT Foods as the merchandiser and head of grain procurement for 11 years. And he's also currently farming uh, wheat, pea, and soybean. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Audrey, for putting this together. It's nice to be back in person versus doing it virtual. I always enjoy coming to meetings and, and trade shows where you can visit with the growers and in person. So it's kind of long overdue on my end. Um, I want to give you a little rundown of our company, kind of where it all started, um, trends of where the markets are heading. Also, um, just kind of give a rundown of some of the exciting products that are coming out of the, the falls this year, out of our Minot North Dakota plant. So AGT is a company uh, formed in Regina, Saskatchewan. We're at El Uh First plant was in Regina. Main plant there did split red lentils, uh, does yellow peas, green peas, also whole lentils. We have railway in Saskatchewan where we do uh, bulk lentils, peas, durum, canola. Our Minot, North Dakota facility that's our fractionation plant. So that's the one that's making all the pea proteins, texturized uh, pulse proteins. I gave everybody here a, a box of pasta that we're making at our Minot plant made out of one ingredient, yellow peas. Uh, we also have our Bell Group in Turkey. They make uh, pasta over there out of Durham, Bulgar out of wheat. Then we have our South Africa plant. Uh, they do some popcorn and in different commodities there and 40 plants worldwide, six key agricultural production areas. And uh, in the US here, we have the Williston plant and then the Minot North Dakota plant. Different products, kind of the key products, the core business is lentils and peas. So red, green, yellow, lentils, yellow and green peas, whole and split. Uh, chickpeas, we get into the coolies, the desis, P90 variety. Uh, we have a Bean plant, St. Joseph, Manitoba, where we do kidneys, uh, pintos, blacks. Uh, we do the Bill Durham in Turkey and several different commodities in Canada. We do a lot of uh, Durham, canola, flax, and a lot of different uh, bulk loaded uh, plants up there. We had just opened the Delisle, Saskatchewan plant, bean plant there where they load out 110 car unit trees. Food ingredients, primarily in Minot, North Dakota. Um, flowers, protein, starches derived from uh, pea, lentils, chickpeas. And we also have a packaged food division called ATT Click, and that is uh, in Canada. So in 2012, 13, we invested in an in ingredient platform. And, and basically the whole vision was for food grade. But at 2013, when we put the pea protein lines in, the pet food market was taken off. So in 2013, June, we completed our first line for pea protein. We completed a second line in May of 2014, and we saw the pet food market just continue to grow. It was growing at a rapid pace, and that was the core of our business at that time. 2015, third line completed, and then we saw a decline in, uh, in the pet food pea protein in about 17, 18. I think 2018 is about when it, it kind of went downhill. Uh, DCM was a big issue that uh, that came about. Um, it's a enlarged heart condition in pets. Basically what happened was FDA said, you know, a couple dogs had, had got enlarged hearts and they got the DCM and they died and uh, traced it back to grain-free pet foods. So. We didn't find any science to back it, but at the end of the day, once it gets on social media, the consumer just kind of halts buying that brand of pet food. The good thing is, in that time frame, we were very active in with food companies, doing different trials. Um, you can see the pasta here. That just doesn't happen overnight. That takes four to five years to produce uh, a, an ingredient or a food product like that. And there's several more down the line, which I'll, I'll get into here shortly. So the veggie pasta, um, one ingredient, which many of the consumers like, they want to know that there's no other additives in there. It's gluten-free, non-GMO, all the peas that we 
we get here are North American grown and processed in Minot. An overview of pulses of why they are so important, key part of nutrition. Uh, you can take a look at, at the protein levels. They're a high protein source, high dietary fiber, low fat. And that's what a lot of the, the markets are looking for. Like Scott said, in India, a lot of the vegans over there, the population continues to grow. They're all vegan based uh, diets. So that's where all of these fit in. And domestically, we're seeing products like this and food companies coming in looking for more and more uh, pulse ingredients to put into different food applications. The launches of pulse ingredients, you can see how the pet food kind of has stabilized, but since 2015, 7,500 of the launches. You know, and of the human foods, and you get into 2019, that's well over probably about 9,500. So the pet food is kind of stabilized as far as new launches, maybe declined in 2020, 2021. But as you look at, at the food, that's where the growth is, and we feel will continue to be. So, dynamics of, of where the market is 2050, global population expected to rise uh, 30% to over 9 billion. You can take a look at the Asia Pacific, like the growth there is, is going to be big. Um, we're going to have to grow a lot more uh, pulses, grains to feed the world. It's just where we're headed with the uh, increased uh, population worldwide. So all the new markets, you take a look at Europe, North America, China. Uh, 2020, I know China, they were in for a lot of, of the LPs which depleted a lot of North American stocks. And uh, you take a look at how pulses fit in the rotation throughout this area, Eastern Montana. It's a key part of our um, rotations out here. And I think uh, going forward, the growth in the pulse sector is gonna only continue to grow. Start with the yellow peas here on the market outlook. Uh, we'll get into production first. Uh, the pea production, this year with the big drought throughout North America. Uh, last year we had about 980,000 metric ton of peas. And at the beginning of the year 2020, um, I didn't think that we were, we were gonna be able to move peas. Like 2020 harvest, we were 350, 375 a bushel on yellow peas. China came in, they bought a lot from Canada. When they're done buying from Canada, they bought from the U.S. and depleted a lot of our stocks along with USDA tenders. So this year's production, 550,000 metric ton. At harvest this year, USDA came in and just bought 50,000 metric ton of yellow split peas. So that drove the market up to some pretty good levels to where we are now. But the production is down straight across the board. I mean, we're down 430,000 metric ton from the 970,000 acres. and. Uh, lowest production since 2012. Lentils, kind of the same thing, lowest production since 2014. Chickpeas, lowest since 2015. So the drought was not a small area. It was all of Saskatchewan and we're still dry in many of these parts, which is still a bit concerning. Canada pulse production, take a look at where they were from 2020 to 2021, same deal. I mean, we're dealing with lower stocks, almost cut in half on peas, lentils down to about a million met ton, and then chickpeas are down significantly as well. Yellow pea market. So the export markets for North American peas right now, really not uh, very active at all. We're kind of priced out of the market. Ukraine's offering for six. $60 to $80 a met ton less. So everybody's gonna to go to Ukraine and buy as much peas as they can versus coming to North America. The one thing that we have for us right now is, is the food ingredient sector and the USDA tenders. That's what's been holding up the LP price. Uh, tenders haven't been as active in September or October, but that August one depleted quite a few stocks in the PL480 program. They gotta be US origin peas. So, you can't, can't buy from Canada, can't buy from anywhere else. They gotta be US orchid. Um, we're the highest price in the world right now, just due to that. And 
or unattractive to the export market. But uh, what will kind of hinge on the LPs going forward is going to be, I think, PL480 and ingredients are going to stay strong. So if we get another tender out there of any significant quantity, I could see these make a make a little run again. Uh, 2021 crop, I would say be at least 60, 65, 70% sold. We got prices right now at 1550 a bushel. Historically, that's right near the top of the market. So the price sum at that range, and if there's a tender that comes along at those levels a little higher, I'd be moving some more. Fertilizer costs are going to be, well, they already are insane. So I'm looking at acres for 2022, definitely going to be up. Acres are going to be up on pulses, soybeans um, out here, especially in the eastern Montana. I'm hearing a lot of wells, hearing a lot of bees, and uh, it may not be a bad idea to post some new crops. Right now we're $11 on new crop yellow peas with Act of God. So the price I'm in that range just is not probably a bad idea considering where the market um, could go. There's so many, so many variables out there with the weather. You don't know with the moisture situation what's going to happen there. But I'd still price some in to get, get a little bit locked in. Green pea market, been getting a lot of calls. Why are green peas lower than yellows? Well, USDA um, really was active in the yellows not active at all in the green tea market. Export markets right now, not really buying a lot. We're 13.75 on old crop, and uh, we don't have a new crop price out there yet, but historically looking at $13, 13.75 range, still a good price on green peas. We're just, uh, same thing with yellows, we're too high in the export market. Uh, I price at least half of them right now. 13.50, 13.75 range is not that price and look for new crop contracts here as they come out. Lentil market, not, not very active now. February to September, that price drove up there. Um, India was a big buyer and we, we still have, I think they'll be back in the market here in November, December, but they just are not buying, they're buying hand to mouth and that's the trouble. They're not buying big volumes, they're buying enough to cover for short term. And, uh, when you get, get into situations like that, the price really doesn't run, although they are buying at the, at the levels of mid 40s right now, which is not a bad price. So for the October, December shipping, we're seeing demand about 25% of what's normal from export customers. And just due to the price, it's too high and they don't want to buy, extend themselves out and get stuck with a bunch of high price levels. I'd sell at least, you know, 65% of your of your old crop, you just look for some new crop. I don't have a new crop well price out as of yet, but I would expect them to be rather attractive once they do come out. Chickpea market outlook, overproduction of chickpeas, 2018-2019. We, we had some big volumes of chickpeas. It deterred guys from growing them just based upon low price in the teens. Guys, main comments were we're not putting them in there. Two to three applications of fungicide for 18 cents is not doesn't cash flow for me. Totally understandable, but now we're in a different, a little different dynamic with with the drought. We have uh, you know U.S. Canada didn't have much of a crop. You think all of you know Turkey and India had some wrecks. So we are not looking at a big world supply of chickpeas, and I think they may be an attractive crop here for this next year. Still, same thing with. Kind of sound like a broken record, but demand on the export market right now isn't, isn't that strong. We have been buying some chickpeas for um, 50 flour in the mine at 45, 46 cents a pound. So pretty good numbers there. I think we'll have some new drop pricing out rather soon. I'd say probably in that November, December time frame. I expect some decent values there too. Uh, I'd be at least 50% sold if you get some in that 40, mid 40 range. One last crop I want to talk about, and it fits in this area to a certain extent. On this year, with the dry conditions, it is, it is a little tough to, to want to go out and, and try a new crop. But if you have irrigation, anything like some heavy soil that 
having trouble with root rot or something like that, this would fit in pretty good. It adapts well to heavier soils, pH is six and a half to nine. It's tall, it's three to five feet tall and 10 to 13 inches or it's kind of where the pot set is. So you're not cutting right on the ground. They put uh, probably means put a lot of nitrogen back in the ground. They're the highest fixing crop of, uh, for a lagoon crop. In crop they fix 30% more than peas. And I think if you can get a 50 bushel crop, I think they said somewhere in that 40 to 50 pounds of anise can put back in the soil. So the fertilizer cost, that's a, that's a good option. Main markets are fractionation. We have a lot of customers coming in now looking for this. We we started on the fava beans and kind of took a risk three years ago or four years ago. We had a lot of the a lot of the customers looking at it, but they never wanted to buy it. They wanted to put it in their food applications. They liked it because it was a high protein source, higher than these, it's 29, 30% protein. But yet they didn't really, it was all a labeling position. They didn't know how the consumer would react to fava beans and it's not that well known. Well, now that they've we've tested it out in our R&D lab and, and brought some food customers in, they really like the functionality of it. So I think there's a, the market's going to grow on this one and it's it's more adapted to the north and probably north central north dakota northeast but one thing is um the allergens in it so soybeans if you have anything with soybeans or anything like that to where there's any contamination it probably wouldn't be a good fit but Berthold, um uh, birds all seed Berthold is handling the seed for us we have the fabel variety it's a low bicene con bicene variety high protein variety so it is a it is a good option, and we'll, we should have some contracts out within the next week on that. So, uh, opportunities and challenges. I think the protein, plant based protein, they're not going to go any way away anytime soon. I mean, we're going to be looking at that into the food sector. Uh, it's growing, and I think it'll continue to grow over the next several years. R and D groups. I mean, we've had countless food companies in our R&D lab with Dr. Mehmet Tolbeck in our Saskatchewan, or uh, Saskatoon lab. He's been doing a lot of R&D with a lot of food companies and doing functionality trials. So I think we're gonna be, we're gonna be seeing this thing grow continually. Uh, one challenge that we're starting to see from some of them, they're just like Scott said, they're testing for glyphosate, paraquat, other chemicals. We have some companies that require yellow peas, they want the, Paraquat test on right away. If there's any detection at all, they don't want anything to do with it. Same with glyphosate. So it's a challenge for farmers because it's a great option for a burn down or for a, a harvest aid. But yeah, we're seeing some resistance from customers on that. So is that more just that guys aren't waiting the seven days to harvest or that's they don't want it? No, all? you know, that's it's sometimes drift. You can even see it in drift. Like there'd be guys that say, hey, I've never sprayed that before, but maybe my neighbor did and there's drift or, but even waiting the seven days, you still get residual. So what do they want farmers to do then? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Kill the crop off. Yeah. That's what we're dealing with. That's what we're telling them. Do you have people swathing or? No, not much. There's some in Canada that that happens, but not, not down here. It is an option, but yeah, yellow peas is primarily where it's at. And we get guys that don't desiccate yellow peas, but when you get into lentils, you get into chickpeas, that's where we're telling them. There's really no other way to yeah. do that. Yeah, exactly. So it is a, it's a big challenge in front of us. And it's not everybody, but there are specific customers where we got to IP it, put it in a different bin and, and run it for them. So. So that's one challenge you can see and we just basically what we do is we we check with the grower it's not right now it's not the huge huge volumes every you know every month we're looking for some but it's not to the point where we're dealing with thousands and thousands of tons of it but something to watch down the road um i would market it in increments i know i've been getting a lot of calls where's the high kind of like durham here how many about a month or two ago? Where's the high on Durham? Well, we all saw when they went to no bid how that worked out and it was panic time. But market in increments, I think, is still your best your best option. 
I mean, you don't if cash flows in your farm, make a sale. Don't sell at all. Sell quarter, third, whatever, whatever works for cash flow in that period of time you need it. Provide your processor for the with a representative sample of each band. It's it's truly important to us and truly important to our customers if we're buying based off of a spec and we get something completely different. It uh, it does create problems for everyone. So being forthright and getting uh, samples is a is a key part of it. Uh, this is more geared towards our mine up plant clean out harvest equipment trailers. Um, I guess both plants it is, but with soybeans, I guess is what I'm I'm alluding to. Soybeans can cause a big problem when we're making pea protein and when we're making baba bean protein, chickpeas, uh, chickpea flour as well. So if you're cleaning stuff out thoroughly, it's very important because it is food grade. There's a reason they're buying peas because they're substituting out of something else. And we're we've got testing so good anymore, we're down to parts per million and parts per billion. So as we're testing our flour, we'll find that and then you know it doesn't work for the customer. So it's very important in order to, to clean out stuff as good as you can and make sure you don't have any issues. One last thing I'd like to bring up is ordering pulse, all your crop or pulse seed and your inoculant early. We're looking at supply chain issues everywhere we go and talking to different seed suppliers. Some of them don't even have price out yet, but I would for sure order early. And by early, I mean probably November and in early December, because after the first year I'm hearing it could be tough to get specific varieties. 